I think it's, it's pretty obvious. We, we know that we are social creatures, right? Human beings are social creatures. We are created to live in communion and relationship with other people. And we know with God, we know this is essential, <clears throat> excuse me, this is an essential part of our spiritual life. Um, if you look at, if you think about all of the lessons you've ever, that you can remember in your life, a bet that you've learned in church or wherever about the spiritual life, I would bet a lot of them have to do something with not just how you relate to God, but how you relate to other people, right? A lot of the lessons that we, that we learn help us navigate the world that we live in, how to treat each other with love, how to exist, how to exist in a community or in relationship, how to navigate these problems. And we also know, um, I, would I would assume that we all pretty much know from experience, that some of the, some of the worst problems that we experience in our life are caused by interpersonal issues, um, whether it be loss or just tension, um, conflict, those kinds of things. Some of the worst things that happen to us have to do with relationships. So this is an important part of our lives in general, and it has a profound impact on our spiritual lives as well. Now, as um, as Abuna alluded to uh, in the announcements earlier, the gospel today was about loving your enemies and turning the other cheek and um, giving without expecting in return. So it seems a little counterintuitive that we would be talking then, you know, about setting up boundaries in those relationships, right? Uh, it seems like those, things, those two things don't go together. Um, but while it seems counterintuitive, uh, it's actually, it's actually the opposite. These two things do make sense. And in fact, um, our big overarching idea for today is actually that healthy boundaries are essential for healthy relationships with other people and with God. So far from, being, uh, far from boundaries being an obstacle that harms relationships or cuts people off from loving each other, they're actually essential for that. So we'll get into it. We'll unpack exactly how that works. Um, so I think in metaphors, that's how I think. I hope this works for you also. Um, one of the, group, one of the uh, authors, or uh, some of the authors that have written about the issue of boundaries from a Christian worldview kind of compare uh, boundary, the boundary issue to a neighborhood. Um, so in a neighborhood, you have a bunch of houses, a bunch of properties, whatever, and they are all separated by a fence, right? Just in this imaginary neighborhood, imagine everyone has fences. Not invisible fences, actual fences. Um, and the fence on each property lets everyone know who's responsible for everything inside that fence. So it makes it clear where one property ends and another one begins, right? So in this metaphor, we are properties in this neighborhood and we have the boundaries between us are fences. Now. Uh, the fences can be of varying heights and, um, you know, uh, strengths. It doesn't have to be a white picket fence. It could be a chain link fence. Different boundaries have, uh, as we heard in the discussion, different boundaries have different levels of um, strength or keeping things out. But what is true in all cases is that these gates are, there's, in the fences there are gates, right? In the fence around your yard there's a gate. The gate opens inward. So you, each person has control over who comes in through the fence and who doesn't. So, it's good to have these boundaries. Um, I think it's probably clear to anyone who's ever lived in a very crowded place or with a bunch of other people that just from that, <clears throat> pardon me, just from that uh, closeness, there can be issues that arise from that. People get grumpy, you just get annoyed with people who are living like, quote unquote, on top of you. <clears throat> and this is not, I mean, not that this is a huge issue, but it does actually, it is true for plants as well. I don't know, I'm, I, I like to garden. Um, I always grew up gardening. And if you plant plants too close together, you could have all the best intentions. Like you want to you wanna have a garden full of beans this year. But if you plant them all together, right next to each other, without giving them any space or planting them in rows, all of them will suffer. All of the plants will suffer. Or maybe a few of them will come up and be kind of strong. Um, but even in a forest, uh, younger trees have to uh, 
uh, grow far enough away from older trees so that they have enough sunlight, they have enough water, they have enough resources. So the metaphors continue. But what we're talking about um, in terms of these houses is that, as, uh, as George mentioned in the discussion, to truly be in a relationship, to truly be in, um, to call what two people have together a relationship, it has to be clear where one person ends and the next begins, right? If we're not sure where the two people are, how can they be in relationship, right? They have to exist clearly, distinctly from each other. And that's where, that's where boundaries come in. So, the fences are boundaries. They help us balance these two needs. Boundaries, in general, help us balance these two needs. We've already talked about how humans have a need for community and togetherness. Um, but we also have a desire and a need for individuality, right? And again, different people, these kind of are found maybe in different equations. But uh, we have a need for togetherness and we have a need for individuality. And as we said, the balance, uh, boundaries help us balance those things. Because going too far to one side or the other, think of this as a spectrum. Okay, going too far on the togetherness side in a relationship can be unhealthy. And going too far on the individuality side can also be unhealthy and damaging. So we'll, let's unpack right now why that is or how that works. One of the things we know for certain, um, that's the testimony of the scriptures and the church fathers very clearly, is that, um, is that sorry, each person is responsible for their own quote-unquote stuff. Right? We know from the creed we will, we will all be judged, each one, according to his deeds. Right? We will all be judged for our own deeds and we are responsible for our own quote-unquote stuff. Um, this is a verse from Ezekiel 18.20. And uh, God says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Okay, so we are responsible for ourselves. And this is one of the main points of what we're talking about today, uh, which is that I and only I am responsible for my thoughts, feelings, and actions. Okay, so repeat after me. I and only I... I and only I am responsible, responsible for my thoughts, feelings, feelings and, actions. and actions. Okay, nice. You now you're sworn in. <laughs> um, and you're married. So, or maybe, I don't know. Okay, I and only I am responsible for my thoughts, feelings, and actions. This is one of our main points. And it seems maybe a little obvious. It seems like, yeah, obviously everyone's responsible for themselves. Like, bless you. Uh, but really, we don't always act like this, do we? And in unhealthy relationships, this, d this isn't very clear. So here's where unhealthy boundaries cause problems. Um, when we talk about the problem of impenetrable, impenetrable boundaries. So if someone goes too far on the individuality side and they say, okay, I'm not going to have any relationship with you. That's the impenetrable, that's like living in a neighborhood with like Trump's wall built around it. Like no one could get in 20, 40 feet high. That's impenetrable, right? So that's on one end of the spectrum. And this can cause problems because we say, okay, if I'm responsible for myself and you're responsible for yourself, I don't even want to hear your problems. I don't, don't, don't bring that to me. It's not, it's not my problem. I don't, I don't even care. And you know what? I don't want to hear it. Don't talk to me about your problems. That's your problem. Okay, so it makes, going too far on this end, makes us cold and unempathetic. We can't, uh, we fail to have any sympathy or empathy for the issues that other people are facing or their emotions relating to them. So that's one problem. I don't, I don't know, my sense is that's not as common as a, as a problem as the, as the problem of going too far to the togetherness side. At least that's my impression. Maybe I could be wrong. But... On the other side of the spectrum, having almost no boundaries, like living in, you know, living in a neighborhood where there's no fences and you know, all the doors are always open and everyone just walks in. That's, that's all the way on the other end of the uh, togetherness side of the spectrum. And this can cause us problems also, this lack of, total lack of boundaries. Um, this leads us to the point where we can't, even dis we can't really distinguish clearly between our problems 
and another person's problems. We can't distinguish clearly between emotions that someone else is having uh, and emotions that we are having. So for example, if someone, if someone is angry, we just become angry also. You know, relationships like that exist. If, if someone is very sad and down, we also become sad and down. That's an example of where uh, a lack of boundaries can have a negative effect. Right? And I'm not saying to not empathize, we'll get into this a little bit, I'm not saying not to feel for the person in that situation, but you don't need to absorb that person's feelings for yourself. Right? Those are their feelings, we recognize that, that you're feeling sad and down, I don't have to feel sad and down, but I can be here to support you. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. But I just wanted to show this, uh, this example, uh, I love Calvin and Hobbes cartoons, I don't know if anybody else is into them, um, but this... Uh, this is Susie, she comes to Calvin, she says, hi Calvin, and he's in a clearly a very bad mood. He's like, humph. Oh, you're real pleasant this morning, what's the matter with you? Go step in front of a cement mixer, okay? What a pill you are, what a jerk. Who needs you? You can just, st uh, you can just stand here and be grumpy all by yourself. <laughs> and now she's grumpy, just like he was, and he says, nothing helps a bad mood like spreading it around. <laughs> right? So now he's happy, he's like, he's got this evil grin on his face, right? And sometimes when we have, we can't draw, draw a boundary, we allow other people to, to put their feelings on us and we get, we have the same emotions they're having. You see how this can sometimes work. Or also on this end of the spectrum of too much togetherness, we may also, uh, just remembering, the, keeping this in mind, sometimes we may feel or someone may make us feel that we are responsible for the way they are currently thinking, feeling, or acting, right? As if, remember, I and only I am responsible. But sometimes people try to make us feel responsible for the way they're feeling or acting. Sometimes we try to make other people feel, or we like to think that other, someone else is responsible for the way I'm thinking or feeling. And again, not saying that people can't have an effect on us, they do, um, but uh, we can't really blame it on that. For example, I have a tendency, um, I have a tendency to get a little defensive sometimes when I'm having a discussion with Sandy, with my wife, and I will say to her, you know, she'll, we'll be having a discussion, and she will say, why, why are you getting so upset and defensive? You're like, you're raising your voice, and I'll say, well, it's because you, and I, I, I don't even need to finish the sentence because no matter what I say there, it's not true, right? It's not a good excuse. No matter what someone is doing to me or saying to me, there's no excuse for me I can't blame them for how I'm acting, right? I can try, but ultimately, they don't have control over me. No one is like putting a robot in my head and telling me, you know, get loud, get angry. I, you know, no one, she's not controlling me. So this is not a good excuse. This is what I'm talking about, the tendency to confuse who is responsible for actions and emotions and feelings and thoughts, things like that. Um, this may also lead, feeling responsible for how other people are, may also lead to a situation where we feel like if something goes wrong or if something happens in someone's life, it's our responsibility to instantly swoop in and fix whatever it is that's going wrong with them. Um, when I'm not saying, again, not to help people, but we do have to recognize it's not always our responsibility to fix everything that's going wrong for someone if they can and should fix it for themselves. Now, I know this sounds a little cold, we'll, we'll unpack. All right, let's see, where are we? Okay, we've also all, just another example of this, and I think this is very common among siblings. I know it was very common among my brother. Like, if we would get caught by my parents doing something we weren't supposed to be doing, we would say, like, he made me, it was his fault. He started it, he made me angry. Like, you know, it's Jay's fault. He's the older sibling, he's supposed to be more responsible. Um, but no, there's no, this is just another example. There's no excuse um, for, there's no, there's no blaming other people for the, for the way we are thinking, feeling, or acting. Ultimately, they have no control over us unless we give that control to them. But ultimately, it's up to us. Um, sometimes people will be upset. Uh, or sometimes I'll get upset from something someone did. And it makes me in a bad mood. And then I say to myself, why am I letting them control how I'm feeling? And then you can almost... You could, you know, sometimes, in some cases, you can almost say, okay, I choose not to feel that way right now. And just be out of it, be free from that. 
don't let them give, uh, don't let people control your emotions and feelings in that way. Now, let's move on to the next, uh, oh, sorry, yes, no, it's your fault. Uh, don't blame someone else. Okay, the next point. Establishing healthy boundaries can be hard. We talked about this in the discussion, some of the challenges that get in the way, why it can be difficult. But ultimately, it's best for everyone involved. That's our uh, next key point. Establishing healthy boundaries can be hard, but ultimately, it is best for all involved. So sometimes, as we talked about, in difficult relationships, setting a, uh, if we're in a situation where we have to set maybe a, a more firm boundary, it, uh, it can be very difficult. It can, it can seem like it's not really the loving thing to do. I think we spoke about that. But it may be in that case. And let me give you, I'm going to give you a metaphor, another one, forgive me, an example of how this will play out. Uh, and I want you to think about, while I'm telling the story, don't get too hung up on the exact details of the story, but think about how it could apply uh, to our lives, depending on the circumstances. So I was at a family party uh, with a bunch of my aunts and uncles and cousins, and it was a situation where all of the adults gathered in the living room, and all of the kids gathered in some other room doing God knows what, uh, wreaking havoc, I'm sure. Now, the parents were kind of having, we were, all the adults were having a discussion together, and one of the parents kept getting, uh, one of the couples kept getting interrupted by their child, running into the room, uh, screaming and crying because, sorry, it's a stock photo, screaming and crying because his shoes had come untied. Now, I don't know how his shoes kept coming untied time after time. It's really amazing to me. I don't know if he was untying them or someone else was untying them. But um, he was getting very upset about it. And each time, he would kind of come and interrupt his parents. And uh, one, or, one or the other of them would go and just tie his shoe real quick and like send him on his way. So, now, when it comes to boundaries, I'm not saying, uh, no one's saying that we should never help a child with their shoelaces. If a child is tripping over themselves, don't say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just respecting a boundary. I'm not going to help you tie your shoe. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying avoid doing acts of love and mercy for people. But let's say, let's look at some of the consequences of this if this pattern, this hypothetical pattern continues, right? Let's say every time, uh, even for years on end, every year of this party, every time the child comes in, um, someone just gets up and, and the parent just gets up and ties uh, his shoes for him. What are, some of the, uh, what are some of the negative effects this could have on the, on the help E, the person being helped, in this case, in the story, the child? But you can apply it to any of our relationships. If someone always comes in to help and is responsible, what are some of the negative consequences? Well, as the child grows or as the help E grows, they could begin to expect that this person is always going to fix that for them even once they learn how to fix it for themselves, right? Even after a child uh, learns how to fix their shoelace, the parents don't continue tying it for them, right? Um, this could also, this could end up with a, uh, with someone, a help E, who is a child in this case, who is incapable of tying their shoes for themselves. Meaning, in our relationships, people that we feel like we're helping in love, we could actually be depriving them of the opportunity to learn for themselves how to deal with their problems. Okay, so, and you know, that leaves that person possibly in a position of always needing the helper to come in and fix something for them. They're not able to do it on their own. That makes sense? Okay, those are some of the uh, effects on the help E, uh, who in this case was the child, but. What are some of the negative effects that this type, of, uh, this type of situation could have on the helper? In this case, the parent who kept tying the child's shoes. Well, the parent who, as we spoke about, thinks they're doing something good and they're motivated by love, no doubt. Um, the parent may be so distracted by this coming in that they fail to um, enjoy the party, right? To enjoy the company of their brothers and sisters, or their cousins, the family. Um, so in a way, they might be deprived of, of their well-being and their relationships from this distraction. And that could also lead to bitterness after a while. If that continues happening, the helper might get bitter that, you know, even they're doing something out of love, they feel deprived. And they might not be able to put words to it, right? 
a parent in that situation is going to get frustrated, like that they're missing out on something good to be kind of absorbed in this issue. Um, so it may make, but, but they may end up feeling resentful and, and bitter towards the child, even though they're not aware of it after a while. Um, so that's one, just one of the negative consequences that this type of lack of boundary in a relationship can have on the helper, the person who is quote unquote helping or believes that they're helping, trying to help. And even uh, we can talk about some of the negative consequences that this type of uh, situation can have on the community in general. In this case, in the story, the family who's at the party, right? Um, first of all, the, the family is going to miss out on having this interaction with the, the person who is ab absorbed with helping this one person. Um, and let's su assume over time the child knows how to tie his or her shoes, but the parent continues to do that, right? The family is going to be deprived. The community is going to be deprived in a sense of that. And interestingly, you often notice, and this actually happened on that day at the party, the parent at one point, I don't know if they were either distracted or they hesitated before getting up, but they hesitated just for a moment. And someone else from the community got up and, and helped the child. Right? Where the parent was getting up instantly as soon as that person came into the room, giving a little bit of space allowed someone else in the community to also take a role and take you know, a blessing or like to uh, have the opportunity to help and to serve that child. Um, so sometimes keeping a healthy boundary or working to put that in place actually benefits the entire community. Now, I realize this situation doesn't apply exactly to all of our lives. And I realize that this is not an easy thing to say. It's not easy to say, uh, and it can almost, setting a boundary in a, in a difficult relationship can almost be as uncomfortable as, as the idea of a crying child coming in with their shoe untied and their parent ignoring them. It can almost be that uncomfortable because um, people from the outside, for people from outside the situation who don't know the situation, we may feel that they're going to judge us. Right? Because they don't understand. Um, we, a parent at, in that situation is probably going to feel like the rest of the family, if they don't get up and help their child, maybe they think people are going to think I don't love my child. People are going to think I'm a bad parent. Um, you know, people are going to think, like, why isn't she making the child be quiet? Like, whatever the case may be, we worry about uh, the way that these decisions are going to be judged by other people. It may appear that what we're doing is cold or heartless, callous, whatever. Um, and some people, so some people just won't understand. One of the people who probably won't understand, at least at the beginning, when we're working on setting boundaries, is the person with whom we're setting the boundary, right? We talked about that it's going to cause tension in that relationship for sure. And the person on the opposite side, I think good communication can really help avoid that. But even with attempted good communication, the person who you're setting the boundary with will likely not understand at first. The child is not going to understand why no one's rushing to help them tie their shoes right away. Um, the child might get even more upset and cry and make you, you know, uh, make you feel even more guilty or make the parent feel more guilty for not rushing in. So it, it's very difficult. The child doesn't understand that actually you're trying to help the relationship in the long run. What you're doing is trying to help the child or the help E grow and be responsible, they can't see at that moment that it's for their own good. And hopefully, we hope that people will understand in the future. Uh, I don't know about you, but I understand now growing up things that used to bother me very much about how my parents did or disciplined me or whatever. I'm so thankful that they did that because I see that it was very good, like it had a positive effects, but we don't see that in the moment necessarily. And um, we have to keep in mind and we have to keep reminding ourselves that once we become um, convinced that a boundary needs to be set, it's going to be hard and it's going to feel uncomfortable, but we have to be reminded and I even suggest surrounding ourselves with people who will remind us that what we're doing is the right loving thing, that it needs to be done and that it's going to be the best thing for everyone in involved in the end. Um, and because it's hard to discern that, I, I recommend um, in any of these cases where it's a difficult relationship, seeking advice from a, uh, from a spiritual mentor, 
who can help you kind of navigate that and make, you know, give you um, assurance that what you're doing is the right thing, that you're not being a bad person, because it will feel like that. Uh, believe me, any time I've tried to do this in my life, there's a lot of uh, guilt and, and doubting, self-doubt that comes along with it. So it, it pays to surround yourself with people who are on the same page uh, and who are going to encourage you through it. So, that's this whole story. I hope we didn't get caught up on that. This is not a story about parenting, really. This is a story about relationships and, and the boundaries that get blurred through them. How we think we're responsible for other people's tasks and, and the negative effects that can have on all the parties involved. So I want to encourage you just to keep this, keep this story in mind. And throughout the week, um, this week, just think about the relationships that you're encountering that come up into your mind. And try to see if anything in this story kind of rings true for those relationships. Um, whether it be that uh, you are the parent in the relationship, so to speak, that you're the one that always feels responsible and comes in to help, that swoops in, um, who needs to maybe set a, a more firm boundary, even though it's hard. Or you may realize uh, that you are the help e of a relationship, that there's something that someone continues to fix for you that you need to take responsibility for. Um, and that can be, that takes a lot of self-reflection and a humility to admit that. So, um, you know, be patient with yourself, but it takes some, some honest self-reflection. Now, this, uh, this is Dudley Do Right. Uh, the question is, how do we do this right? I just, it's in honor of Canada Day, so he's a Canadian mountain police. Sorry. I was, it was funnier when I was putting it together. Okay, how do we do this whole situation right? How do we do boundaries right? Like Dudley do right. So let's talk about um, how do we do this right, right? Uh, let's talk about a healthy model of how we do this, how we have relationships where we help people. Um, a, health, a healthy model of how we quote unquote pour ourselves into other people. Because some of you might be saying, as we heard in the comments uh, or you know the discussion earlier, wait a second. All the stuff you're saying, it sounds okay, but I thought like Christians are supposed to, you know, everything we read in the gospel today, just um, like, you know, forget about our own needs and interests um, and, and just look only to the interests of others. Forget about what we need and um, don't care about anything like that. Just give everything to other people. In a sense, yes, but it's more complicated than that. Um, healthy boundaries facilitate a truly Christian model of service to others. That's our last main point. Okay, um, let's unpack it. First of all, uh, we are not supposed to forget our own needs, right? Scripture doesn't call us to forget about our own needs, but rather not to forget about the needs of others. So let's read Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or vain conceit. So, sorry, just right off there. The problem is not so much our, the needs that we have, which we all have, but the selfishness of it. Okay, we'll come back to that. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Right? So the verse doesn't say forget your own interests. It just says don't look out only for your interests. Also look out for the interests of others. You can't, if you look out only for your own interests and not the interests of others, that's selfishness and pride, and that's where the problem comes in. Okay? So we, we must, yes, forget our sinful desires, like selfishness and pride, but not the needs and desires that we have that are good. We do have good needs and good desires that shouldn't be neglected um, when, they, when they appear. So... God doesn't want us to forget about those true, healthy, good needs that we have. And uh, I'm just going to ask, James, can you help me move the table? We're going to do a little demonstration. No one gets scared. It's only water. I'm not doing any chemistry here. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, that should be good. Thanks. All right. Can you just check on the, make sure it's like appearing on the camera? Thank you. Okay. So we're talking about how do we, you know, one of the metaphors we talk about for serving others is pouring ourselves into other people. How do you do this in a healthy way, right? So this is what we're going to do. Uh, this is what we're going to do now. Um, now, notice. Um, 
I guess I don't really need this. Just okay. So we have here uh, a cup and a bowl in both cases, right? And uh, just imagine that the cup is pretty much full. I mean, it's almost all the way full, right? You, you can see it from there. Okay. So we're going to look at two different models. Um, let's imagine that the bowl and the cup are different people, and the cup is the help e or the helper, the person who wants to pour into someone in this relationship. The bowl is a is a person in need. Okay, so where we're trying to pour ourselves out into. Now let's look at different models of how this could work. Okay, one model. Okay, what do you what do you notice? What do you notice about the uh, about the cup? The cup plus water. Okay. Okay, nice. I like it. Well, I mean, it's still surface area, so like, in, in one way, like, the, the cup is still kind of full, but even though, like, the bowl got water, it still looks empty. Okay, okay, nice. So the, the bowl didn't get really that much. It got something, but also what resulted is that the, the cup, the original, um, the original person was was reduced, right? They're, they're a little empty now. They're maybe, uh, depending if you're an optimist or pessimist, they might be half full or half empty. I don't know. The cup lost a lot. So that's, that's one way. Now let's look at, let's look at a second way of uh, pouring oneself out in, from the cup into the bowl. Let's imagine the bowl is full. Okay, so what do you notice in this case? Okay, symbiotic. They're both full. Okay, did the did the level of the cup go down? Okay, like a fountain, exactly. So this is a demonstration to show that when God calls us to help and serve other people. Um, it doesn't have to involve us harming or hurting ourselves in the process, right? This isn't true. We have to get rid of our selfish desires, but our, our healthy needs are good. So Christ never asks us to harm ourselves to help someone else, okay? Now, it depends on how you define harm. I'm not talking about, he never asks us to give up something. He asks us to give up things to help other people. But it doesn't harm us. Sometimes the things we're asked to give up, it's good for us to give up, right? Don't think about it as harm. So Christ emptied himself in, in the incarnation. He became a human being. But uh, did he compromise his divinity to become a human being? Was he any less, was he less than fully God? No. He didn't compromise his divinity in emptying himself. He didn't, you know, he didn't lose anything. Did he just go along in, in his life and the way he acted with people? Did he, um, did he go along with what people asked of him or told him to do just to make those people happy? No, he didn't do that. He set, he set boundaries on how he was going to act. A lot of it is uh, what was mentioned, knowing yourself and setting those boundaries um, and making, making a decision that these things are important. But to make this second model work for us in our relationships. What's essential? What was, di what was the, the factor that was not involved in the first model that was involved in the second model? Source. Right. The source, right? The, the, this, this water pouring into it, right? This was just one thing pouring into another. In the second demonstration, we had something else. So to make this second model work for our relationships, we have to be filled with the source of living water. Okay, if we're not, if we need to be connected with God and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Only then can our lives overflow to the point where we can help heal other people and serve other people without it reducing us, without it tearing us down. Okay, so as, you notice, I mean, as the water was leaving this cup, it was being filled with other water, right? So this is why I'm saying, giving things up, we will always be filled. It was amazing. I didn't even plan this, but the last verse of the gospel reading today says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. 
For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. God is saying, give and it will be given to you. Empty, empty yourself in front of God and he will fill you. Empty yourself in an unhealthy way and you will experience the, the effects of it. It's, uh, it's not a good situation to be in. If we empty ourselves before God, he will fill us. Um, so in some ways, I, this seems kind of counterintuitive too, but in some ways, if you have a relationship that you want to serve that person and, and you're having a difficult... We might think the best thing we could go do is go right to them and fill their needs. I would suggest that if there's someone we want to help and serve, the best thing we can do is go into a room by ourselves and pray or do any of the things, any of the practices and disciplines that the church has given us to commune with God and be filled with his Holy Spirit. Because... The person you're trying to serve in the end, and this is something that Abuna always reminds us, the person you're trying to serve, they don't need you. I don't mean that in a mean way, but they don't need you. Nobody, I mean, we need each other in a sense, but they need God. They want God and they need God. And only by us filling ourselves with Him can we give that to someone else. Otherwise, we're just giving them out of what measly, uh, measly things we have apart from God, which is, what do we have apart from God? So, um, I would just encourage us, regardless of you know, the state of boundaries in our relationship, to think about them, think about that, how they should be improved, and absolutely, regardless of the state of any of our relationships, being filled, um, being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, through, through all of uh, the life of the church and, and everything that's been handed down to us, all of these practices and disciplines, that's the number one thing we can do to improve uh, the quality of, of our relationships with each other and with God. And the beauty of it is, uh, if we're worried about running out of water, don't be worried. If we're connected to the source, to God, it's, there's more than enough to go around. We never have to worry about anyone, there not being enough for anyone, or anyone running out, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, glory be to God forever. Amen.